in episode 1, we discussed position embeddings in great depth. In episode 2, we wrote on the back of multi-head attention and self-attention mechanisms. In this episode, which is going to be the final episode of this series, we will begin our journey by discussing residual connections and then move on to layered normalization. Our journey will end with Transformers Decoder Module, where we'll touch upon some essential decoder components such as the softmax and the output embedding layer. Finally, we'll finish by understanding its mass attention module. Now, if you came here for only the mass attention component, I suggest you check the timestamps in the video's description and fast forward to that time. Otherwise, let's dive straight in. Residual connections serve two main purposes, knowledge preservation and helping with the vanishing gradient problem. Let us discuss this knowledge preservation aspect. To make things more concrete, consider this small neural network composed of a bunch of neurons. During forward propagation, the inputs may get modified considerably by the time they reach the last layer. And this may result in the loss of some useful information that were present early on in the system. For example, the blue layer weights may have positional information freshly encoded, which may be forgotten by the time the information reaches the fourth layer. Now the question is, how do we make sure that the useful old information does not get lost? One solution is to add residual connections, which essentially are information highways that bypass a lot of intermediately layers and feed information to much deeper layers. We then simply add these two pieces of information and get our final layer output. This helps the deeper layer not forget important information that was present early on in the system. And from here, the forward propagation continues as usual. In summary, a residual connection is a lot like taking a shortcut, bypassing everybody else, and then getting back on the racetrack. Awesome, let us proceed further. So we now have the output of the embedding layer that uses the highway residual connections to go on to the next layer. We also have the output of the multi-head attention component that too goes on to the next layer. So what is this next layer? Well, we call it the add and norm layer. The add part means simple addition of the two inputs that get fed to this layer, and we get a summed output. The norm or the normalization part is a bit more tricky. Let us zoom in the summed output to understand this better. As you can see, each row corresponds to a word in the sentence, and each column to features. We have discussed features in context of word embeddings in episode 1, and so feel free to go over it again just in case this is confusing. Layer normalization simply means standardizing the neuron activations along the axis of the features. To do that, we take each of the neuron's activations and subtract the mean from them. We then divide the value by the standard deviation and finally add a small value to the denominator just to make sure that it never lands up being zero, thus blowing off this course to infinity. And that's it! We standardize every value in the matrix this way. Cool, let us proceed even further. Next in row we have a bunch of linear layers with relevant activations in between. We had covered linear layers in episode 1, as far as activation functions are concerned, I will skip them here because there are a bunch of other awesome videos and blogs explaining them. With that, what do you know? We have slayed the encoder concepts of transformer neural networks. The decoder mostly relies on similar concepts. In fact, there are only a handful of components that work slightly different when compared to the encoder. So join me and let's finish this off together. In general, the encoder takes in the input text and converts it into some vectorized representation. The decoder then takes this representation and converts it into new text. Now, one major difference between the encoder and the decoder is that, while the encoder takes just one input, that is the source text, the decoder takes two. The first being the output of the encoder, and the second being the output text that has been generated thus far. Let us start with this first input. 
After we get the output of the encoder, we split it into two copies. These are the query and the key copies. Check out episode 2 for a detailed description about the query and the key value matrices. For now, let us leave these matrices up here for the time being and focus on the bottom of the decoder, which mainly deals with the generated text. We usually assume that the first word the decoder generates is a special token indicating the start of the generated sentence. We feed this token as the first input to the decoder. From here, it travels through the output embedding layer, which converts it into an embedding vector. And then we add positional information to it and pass it on to the multi-head attention layer. Ignore the masking part from now, we will come back to it later. The output of the multi-head attention layer then goes on to the add norm layer. This gives us our value matrix. And finally, we send our value matrix to the decoder's second multi-head attention module. Now, if we zoom into this multi-head attention layer, you will see that the decoder's multi-head attention layer in fact takes three inputs. The first being the query and the key matrices that came from the encoder, and the second being the value matrix that comes from the previously generated text sequence. The multi-head attention module takes these three inputs and then works exactly the same way as was covered in episode 2. Okay, what now? The output of the multi-head attention layer flows forward. Let us pause at the final linear layer as this is kind of important. The final linear layer possesses a bunch of fully connected neurons. Now, the size of this layer depends on the number of classes there are. If your classifier is supposed to distinguish dogs from cats and hence just has two classes, the final dense layer will have only two units. If you also want to classify, say, baby dragons, you will have to throw in another unit, and hence the size of your linear layer is going to be 3. When speaking of dialogue generation, on the other hand, the size of the final layer is the total vocabulary size, which is quite intuitive if you think about it. Text generation is in fact a classification task where every word can be considered a class on its own. For instance, if our input text is when you play the Game of Thrones, the classifier will have to assign probabilities to each of the n words in its vocabulary. We then often choose the word with the highest probability to continue generation. The input to the final linear layer of course is not raw text, but the output matrix from the add and norm layer. If we send this matrix as it is, the output will be such that each unit in the final linear layer outputs a vector. Now, the problem is that we don't want vectors. What we want instead are scalar probability scores for every word, so that we could pick the word with the maximum score. To achieve that, we'll first have to flatten our matrix into a single row. We then concatenate these and pass them to the linear layer. The information is passed by each input dimension being multiplied by the next layer's parameters and then being summed together. Please check episode 2 for more details on linear layers. As a result of this, we get a single score for each word. We call these raw scores the logits. We then pass these scores into the softmax layer and get them converted into probabilities. Finally, we can choose the word with the highest probability for generation. Now that you understand the first time step, let us see how the decoding process works in its entirety. So far we saw that the decoder first consumes the encoder output. We also pass on the first generated word, which is a special token indicating the start of the generated text. This token is passed to the output embedding layer and then the position information is added to it. Finally we pass it on to the remaining layers and have the next word generated. We follow the same steps for this newly generated word, except now the decoder consumes both the first and the second word. And using these, we get a third word in the sequence. This process continues till the decoder generates a special end token. Awesome! You are now ready for the last component of the transformer neural network architecture.
that is the mass multi-head attention module. The main use of the masking modules comes to fruition during the training phase. Unlike in France, where we do not know the answers beforehand, during the training phase, the model gets provided with both the source dialogues as well as how to complete these dialogues, aka the target dialogues. This allows it to learn from its mistakes. Let's pick an example dialogue to make things more concrete. How about this one from Lord of the Rings? In this scene, a young warrior confronts the invincible Nazgul, to which he says, You fool! No man can kill me! The warrior then takes off her helmet and says, I am no man, and thrusts her sword, killing him. I mean, has a more epic line ever been written? So during training, the model gets provided with this source dialogue, as well as the correct way to complete this dialogue. There is one cache though. The target dialogue is masked. Why, you ask? Well, a teacher does not straight away show you all the answers during a practice exam, does she? You are first required to use your own mind and come up with your own answers. It is only then the teacher tells you how well you did and provides you with the correct answer. This way, you can better learn from your mistakes. Similarly, after the input text gets passed into the transformer, the decoder generates its first text. Let us say that the first generated word is you. We then unmask and show the model the actual word that it should have generated instead. In this example, that word is I. Now, unlike inference, where we pass decoder's own predictions back to it, during training, we pass the correct target word to the decoder. This is sometimes also called teacher forcing. This helps the model in quantifying the difference in between the probability distribution scores across the true labels and the model's predictions. One way to quantify this difference and to compute the loss is using the cross entropy loss function. We will skip those details here. All right, so far we have discussed why we need masking. Now let us see how to do it. Do you recall how we had generated the attention scores in episode two? Just before we pass these scores to the softmax layer, we perform the masking operation. So what is masking operation? It is simply a filter matrix where all the future words process a score of negative infinity. For instance, if we are at the time step where we just landed up generating a sequence up till the word M and would like to generate the next word in the sequence, the mass filter would add negative infinity to all words after the word M as their mass scores, thus masking the future words. The final result looks something like this. Once we pass the mass attention filter through the softmax layer, notice how all the negative infinities got zeroed out. Therefore, when predicting the word after M, the model pays attention to only all the words before M and pays zero attention to the words that follows it. Here is another quick visualization to make this concept more concrete. At zero time step, the model pays attention to the vectorized input text obtained from the encoder and the special start token. Please note that instead of the start token, I'm using the end token of the source sentence this in theory should make no difference since the end of the source sentence is the start of the target sentence. Now let us say it landed up predicting the word you. We then unmask the first true label and feed it to the decoder. Therefore, for its next prediction, that is time step one, the model pays attention to the encoder output as well as the true target word of the previous time step, that is the word I. Let us say it lands up now predicting the word R next. We then unmask the second target word. And the process continues until it generates the end token. When this happens, note how the model is paying attention to the input text as well as all the target tokens up till the end token. In this example, it lands up generating gibberish, but that is what training is all about, improving upon your past predictions. During inference, the true target tokens get replaced with the model's predictions. And that's it. You've mastered masking. A girl now is truly no one. 
Oh, and just in case you're wondering how did Transformers actually land up completing Cersei's dialogue to Ned Stark? Well, in the TV series, she had said, when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. I went to Hugging Face website and used their GPT-2 model, which is a Transformer-based architecture, to complete her dialogue for real. And here is how the model completed Cersei. When you play the Game of Thrones, or whatever you do, you're not even a very good player. Ha, that's so Cersei. And if you think about it, this is quite witty. The stocks were pretty dumb. I mean, this dude got his head chopped off in the first season itself. Whew, that's it. You made it. Well done, Dragon Warrior. You hopefully now understand the most powerful architecture in the NLP world. This calls for a celebration. I mean a real celebration. I hope I was able to serve you well in this journey. Until another AI adventure that we undertake together. Farewell, my friend.